I'm so excited. Woo! Hello! We're here at Geneva State Forest, and we're uh, here with the uh, Alabama Treasure Forest Association Geneva State Forest Tour. We're going to climb on a, uh, a, a tractor, and we're going to go look at the forest. So, hey, come with us. hiking trail that goes around the lake. We've got a group of volunteers that meet regularly, that work with all the public, trying to keep things, keep us from re having recreational conflicts. And then we have the forest management that goes on. Normally we're uh, harvesting from 300 to 600 acres of timber per year, or reforesting of that amount. And hopefully y'all are gonna get to see that today. Uh, well, this morning what I want to do, we're going to be on the tour for about three hours. So if you need to use the restroom, this would be the time to do it. We'll have drinks on the tour. So if you will, let's just get our stuff. And in the next 10 minutes, we'll make our way over to the wagons and load up. While we're out here, we want to make sure that uh, we're watching where we walk. We've got all kinds of little critters crawling around, and some big ones, and, some big ones. and big ones. And just be careful where you step, and uh, watch out for everybody else too. Okay? We've uh, this is Harold Wise. He's our adjacent landowner here. We've got a uh, a campground adjacent to the place, and you can walk through the trail right there. And he's actually got 
uh, a camp house that has got something besides porta toilets. So if y'all y'all are more than welcome to walk yeah, over there too there. and uh, use the restroom. But let's say in ten minutes we're gonna load up, okay? Okay. <laughs> Everyone, this is Richard Tharp. He's a biologist with the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. He works the District 4. And this is Chris Cotton. He actually works here at Geneva State Forest and at Blue Springs Management Area. And they're going to give you a talk that speaks today on wildlife habitat improvement. Thank y'all for being here. Glad y'all came out this morning. That nice cool cool day for it so we hope y'all have a good day and uh, again thank y'all for coming we are going to talk about wildlife habitat improvement and that can cover a wide array of uh, topics and techniques and we're just going to touch on some of those and, and explain a little bit about what they what they're good for and what they can do and uh, while you're here on the Geneva State Forest everything that we mentioned they're doing here on this forest somewhere so somewhere in your tour uh, you're probably going to see these techniques that we're talking about so keep your eyes open and, and uh, you'll see them. Uh, first stop is right here on a uh, what I term as a wildlife opening or a food plot, a lot of people call it. So that's the first topic that we're going to talk about. And my first question to you is why would you want to plant a wildlife opening or a food plot? Don't be bashful. I'll call them. I'll call them. Okay. okay. That's exactly right. A lot of people plant it uh, so they can see what's there, particularly deer, and harvest particular deer. Okay. Any other reasons? Okay, Pro provide an additional food source during the leaner times of the year, especially late winter is one of the uh, weaker seasons. We have uh, natural, provide food, natural food, so this is a food source for those leaner times here. There's two excellent reasons, and that's, uh, what, I was what I was hoping to say. I would say. One of the things one on, the on the supplemental, supplemental, supplemental plants or wildlife is that, that you have to consider is location and size. Where you put a food plot and how big you're going to make it. And a lot of that has to do with economics, you know, what you can afford as far as what you're working with. Uh, I say locate them in travel corridors where most of your wildlife animals are going to be moving and a lot of times those are located in uh, along streams, rivers, creeks, things like that. Animals uh, seem to move toward those areas because they have been left <coughs> uncut for many, many years. They just get used to traveling those areas, travel corridors, so that's a good place to locate a wildlife opening. Uh, in wildlife openings, of course, you're going to plant things and in this one here, you can't see it a lot yet, but if you were to walk out there, you're going to find this plant right here in abundance out there. Is anybody starting to close up already? Does anybody know what this is? Okay, looks like a mimosa. Okay. Looks like a partridge pea. Okay. Looks like a partridge pea. That's exactly right. This is a partridge pea plot. And a partridge pea is just a plant that produces some small pods. And it's a legume. Uh, produces those pods. And it's a very good quail food source. 
So this is basically what this small area here is, is aimed at is to provide food and cover for quail. All right. uh, you know, also, you know, there are many other types of plants you can plant in a wildlife opening or food plot. Uh, I'm not going to cover them all. I mean, there's, you can go to any feed and seed store and spend as little or as much as you want on, on different plantings. But, to, you know, there are species specific plantings where if you're managing for deer, things that uh, they can plant that will benefit those more. Things for quail, things for turkey, and there's things that work for multiple species. So, you know, learn about those particular plants and, and pick what's going to benefit you and the animal that you're wanting to manage the most. All right? One of the things you need to do in a wildlife opening or food plot is think about your soil, soil considerations. What kind of soil do you have? Uh, what do you need to do? Well, anybody know what this is? It's a soil, the soil test. Right. test. That's exactly right. If you know about this, then that's good. A lot of people don't utilize these, and that's a big no-no. Uh, this is just a box that you can take a sample out of your food plot or wildlife opening and send it to a lab. And they're going to send you back the results of how much fertilizer you need for a particular crop, uh, how much lime, and, and, and that sort of thing. One of the things that it tells you is the pH of the soil. Uh, pH of the soil is basically a numerical value from 1 to 14, with 7 being neutral to tell you how acidic or how alkaline your soil is. And of course, plants have to grow in particular soils, depending on how acidic and all that is. Uh, it's a measure of the hydrogen ions in the soil. Uh, pH scale is a logarithmic scale, it's a 10 scale, so if your soil came back as uh, 4.5, uh, compared to a 5.5, it's 10 more times acidic than a 5.5, just kind of give you a, a reference point. Uh, most plants grow better toward a neutral soil, which is a 7, of course, right in the middle, and that's where you want to try to get your soil. Well, how do you get it if it's too acidic? How do you get it toward the alkaline end? Well, you have to put lime out there. And why would you do that? Well, we're going to do a look. Who's very strong? Who's strong? Ham, you're very strong. <laughs> Why don't you take those apart for me right there? Could you do that, please? Just take that off right there for me, okay? I'll give you about 30 seconds. Work on that magic trick right there. See if you can get that off. Oh, come on. Now, use those muscles and take that off of there. Can't do it? How about, where's a strong man at? Come here, sir. Clint? This is Clint, everybody. Give him a round of applause. Take that ball out. Thank you for yeah. trying. Donald, would you tear my equipment up now? <laughs> you gonna make it in the park, don't you? <laughs> Are bound to the soil particles when your soil is too acidic, just like this lock in this, it's bound together. And how you get them apart, how do you get these apart? with a key, okay? You know what this key represents? Lime. Lime. That's exactly right. You put lime in your soil, it's gonna unlock those nutrients that your plants need, and they're gonna be available to the plants then, okay? Thank y'all for working my little <laughs> magic demonstration there. All right, uh, so you have to lime to get the pH up where it needs to be so your plants can get those nutrients they need. Otherwise, they're bound into the soil and they will not be available to your plants. Did you know if your soil sample comes back with an acid rate of 4.5 that 70 percent of the nutrients that you put out there in fertilizer are unavailable to the plants? In other words, 70 percent of the money you spent on fertilizer is flushed down the toilet. Okay? Uh, at 6.5 uh, acidic rate, 20 percent. See, you're approaching, I'd rather have, you know, 80 percent being available than 30 percent. Uh, Microorganism activity is reduced in acidic soils. Legumes can't fix nitrogen. Uh, what kind of lime do you need? Two forms, calcitic and dolomitic. And the only difference is dolomite lime is high in magnesium. I'm gonna stop right there and let Chris go because I know I'm taking all the time. Jump on Chris. Uh, I guess my topic, uh, prescribed fire. You're gonna hear that. I know there's a whole topic on prescribed fire, so I'm just going to touch on it briefly. And what it does, really from a wildlife standpoint, uh, I think the topic later is going to be on a, on a timber standpoint. Um, 
But one of the reasons we burn, and you'll actually travel through some burned areas that we've done recently, is for wildlife, it brings the, uh, the vegetation back to an early successional state. And when it starts growing back, it's young and tender and a lot, it produces a lot of good browse for wildlife, deer, turkey, and everything. Um, it also diversifies your plant growth, what's coming back up there, uh, which is good for each different type of species that you got. The quail's not gonna like it, the same thing as a deer. Or you may prefer something a little bit different. Uh, it also uh, increases what type of seed you're gonna have out there, what's coming back up in the litter layer. Uh, a lot of times you'll you'll burn something like this right here and what you'll see coming back up is a lot of ferns. Well, if you walk out there now, you're not seeing any ferns, but that seed is in the litter layer. Uh, it also increases uh, insects. Uh, insects are very important for quail, turkey. Uh, when they come through here, that's basically what young turkey poults eat. That's the first thing they eat is seeds and uh, insects, grasshoppers, crickets, stuff like that. Burning also is very important because it uh, puts nutrients back in the soil. Everything that you burn up, uh, this plot right here, for example, whenever we built this plot, we took a dozer and we pushed off all the topsoil. That really is not good, but if you was to burn that, all that slash and stuff right there, all that nutrients is going back in the soil right there. So it, it, it helps, uh, and maybe our plan is to extend this plot and make it a little bit bigger. And uh, I guarantee you that side will be a, produce more than this side would. Uh, there was a recent study done uh, at Tall Timbers Research Station on turkeys. And it said that uh, a turkey hen would hardly ever go in a place that wasn't burned within two to three years. Uh, a lot of turkey hunters I know love burning this time of year. We, we've actually got some guys that love it too much. They set stuff on fire and it's arson and it causes a lot of headaches for our guys over there. But uh, prescribed burning is a very important tool. It's very cheap compared to other, uh, say, mowing, mulching, something like that. And it's kind of a more bang for your buck type thing. Um, and that's that's pretty much all I got on, on burning. I know we're going to run short of time. You just touch on two things. Just What's the latest anyone should burn, not to disturb uh, nesting? Um, well, it really depends. I, I haven't read the whole article, uh, but it did talk about uh, nesting. Uh, and a lot of, I know turkeys will read nest. Uh, you can burn and they'll come back and they'll read nest. Um, it really just depends on that particular bird. Most of the time, the benefit outweighs the negative. Um, because if, if you never burn and your habitat grows up, gets too thick, and like I said, those hens, turkeys will never go in there, then they're not using that to nest. So you may mess up one year of nesting, but you're going to gain more in the long run. Any more questions? Okay. Yes, sir. I have a question about uh, putting lime out there. Okay. Is there a danger that you over lime and the pH goes over seven? That is a possibility. Your soil sample will, will give you the rate that you should, so many tons per acre, and I recommend that you follow that. But you can over lime, and if you go toward the alkaline end of the scale, you're reducing what your plants can do. Uh, you know, just like our black belt soils in Alabama will only grow certain types of plants because it's too alkaline. So yes, sir, you can go too far to the other end of the scale. I see. So you have to be around seven. That's where you want to be. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank exactly you. right. And yeah. a lot of times when you fill out that soil box, you'll put in there what you want to, uh, what, what you want to, to what species you want to plant. Say I put partridge pea on there. They'll send you back your results, and it'll say okay uh, you need to add this many pounds per acre of lime and fertilize and and they'll get you right where you need to be because each species is just a little bit different what uh, they would prefer uh, partridge pea may prefer a seven whereas maybe a wheat may be just a little bit under that praxis for instance burning gopher tortoise that's, that's he has to have that to survive uh, we have gopher tortoises here on the on the state forest and yeah, you know, that's just the benefit that they receive from all the burning they do out here. All right, I'm going to talk about herbicides real quick, chemicals. And if you don't have one of these books, 
I'm not, I, unfortunately I can't be here all day, but Chris will be here. If you want any of these publications that we show or talk about, Chris, if you'll take a yeah. pad and get their yeah. uh, information address, we'll be glad to see you one. This is non-native invasive plant for the Southern Forest. If you don't have one of these, be glad to provide you one. This is a lot of the plants that we're trying to rid Alabama of that uh, aren't beneficial to wildlife or pretty much anything else. In fact, they're a nuisance to about anything that we do. But why do we use chemicals or herbicides? You know, they get a bad name. A lot of people think, oh, they spray out there, they're killing everything. Not necessarily. Uh, you know, chemicals can remove unwanted species, these that are listed in this book. You can root, you know, use it, select herbicides to remove particular plants and leave particular plants. Let's say you want to leave your legumes, there are sprays that will do that. So you can get uh, selective herbicides. Of course, they're non selective that you spray over, uh, over a clear cut that pretty much burns everything to the ground. Not necessarily a bad thing for right then, but the benefits that you get after that are very positive because you get a flush of growth that uh, a lot of animals need and utilize. Uh, you know, chemicals can be used to maintain the habitat in a particular uh, stage. Uh, you know, we figure that a forest has four stages. You start with stage one, which is bare dirt. Uh, two, grasses and weeds, which would almost be like a, a wildlife opening. Three is seedlings and brushy vegetation. This is kind of in a three, five stage because we do have a forest over the top over here. Stage four is young trees and stage five is more of a forest. Uh, but if you wanted to keep a, you know, a particular tract of land or a portion of a property in stage two, grasses and weeds, you can do that with chemicals. You can, you can select the right chemicals that will keep the shrubby competition out of there and trees and keep it in herbaceous vegetation. That's what chemicals can do for you. All right, how do you get them out there? Broadcast, spot spray, that's what a lot of people utilize to get rid of some of this junk. You know, they go in a creek bottom that's full of uh, privet or something like that, hack and squirt. Machete, give it a little squirt of juice in there and that one's toast. Uh, our injection, make tools that you go along and jam into the trunk of a tree injects the chemical in there and it may take it two or three years but it's it's gone that's how you how you can get it on the ground of course you got helicopters that'll spray it all over and all that stuff too but uh, all right that's all about any I just very briefly about herbicides but any questions what about if you have like a stream or something going through I okay. mean, is that going to hurt anything I mean in some situations yes you always want to read labels and if you're uncomfortable and familiar consult somebody that's uh, certified in herbicide use uh, and you need to get them to do it for you or to guide you or you know whatever but yes some chemicals can damage streams fish that sort of thing so you have to read those labels and see what's safe and you have to use them properly you can't uh, use chemicals not only is it going to provide some food and stuff out here it provides edge which is the habitat around the food plot where most animals make their living on the edge uh, animals don't live out in these food plots a lot Otherwise, every time we walked out there, we'd see one. We don't. They make their living in the transition between forest and a, another type of habitat. So, creating edge, also providing food source. But there's there's really no rhyme or reason, you know, to to a size. It's what you can. What I've you got can a food plot book over here. I'll give you, and it'll tell you about that. And you're welcome to one of them and read upon it. But I mean, anybody else? Are we done? Okay. <laughs> Should have stopped earlier. Y'all will, let's load back up.
send off in about five minutes. <laughs> and uh, when you know, you got longleaf seedlings, you got uh, loblolly seedlings. There's a lot that you can do with longleaf that you can't do with loblolly. And uh, I wanted to point out a few of those things on this tour. Uh, right here is one of the longleaf seedlings. It's starting to come out of the grass stage. Usually, if that candle or bud is elongating, so you can tell that one elongated probably to four inches. You can kill it when you run fire through it at that point. But they were they were about an inch long. We sent the fire through fast. We had the same type fuels. There were warm season grasses. Some of the uh, that burn, they close up around the bud and they protect it and keep it from killing it. So then the fire went through and as you can see, all this is it's greened up and uh, it's killed a lot of these species that we don't like in our forest stands that create a bad wildfire hazard. One of the species is right here. Uh, this is dead, this is Yopon. It's in the uh, holly family. It's a real waxy plant. And you can see over there in that stand that we just left, this is getting pretty thick and if fire gets in it, it can get pretty, pretty intense too. And we're, uh, when we go through the stand, you can see the, a lot of the warm season grasses. There's a lot of their third growing season, and you can see they're coming out of the grass stage. You can see them, there's some of them out here that's four feet high. But after this burn, I think we stimulated a lot of them to coming out of the, the grass stage. And, uh, and another thing I was going to point out, you know, take care of the brown spot problem. It burns the needles off, and then then the, the seedlings can develop. And that's about really all I've got to say here. Three or four feet tall there. How big were they when you burned? How tall were they when you And then the bud was up about an inch, and since we burned it that day, that bud further elongated, and then it, it developed and started putting on the needles. And then, you know, it was actually had a bud for the limb there, too. So that, that seedling there come out of the grass stage last year, come up to that high. And you can see right here we had a lot of loblollies. There's some of the loblolly that live, but very few, and eventually we'll wipe them all out. They can't cut the fire. Not in that. Everybody's asking me the age is about, it's right at 80 years old. There's trees out here that are younger and there's trees out here that are older. But uh, in 2000, I believe it was 2009, we had the American Recovery Act that came about with the stimulus package. And they were needing things to do in Alabama to, to create work. One of the problems that we have with longleaf pine in general is the uh, getting the seedlings to replant because we, we have a hard time with the seed sources. There's not many areas where they can get seed and then longleaf pine normally doesn't have a good seed crop but maybe one out of every seven years. So basically the bottleneck with producing longleaf pine is the seed. So an idea that we came up with as far as the Stimulus Recovery Act was to come here at Geneva State Forest and mulch some of these areas that were too grown up so that they would have areas that they could go in and collect for seed to, so that we would have enough seed in the southeast to, 
serve the need of the seed lending man. And back in 2009, if you look at this ephemeral pond down here, you can see the yield pond and how high it is. Some of it's 15 feet high, 15 and 20 feet high. And uh, that's terrible. When, uh, when you're trying to burn something like that, and I've got a lot of experience trying to, it's either too dry to burn it, or it, and it creates a fire that's too hot, or it's too wet, and you can't even get a fire to go through it. It just is terrible. So an alternative to that, in my opinion, was sending the mulching machines out here. And what we did, it was in 2009, November, we had two different types of mulching machines that worked on the state forest. And one of them was the skid steer machines with the uh, blade. The other type was the skitter type machines, the big, huge machines. And they had roller heads on the front of them with hammers. And they, they was just, the actual machine that worked in this area was the uh, skid steer with the blade. And I'm telling you, it was 15 feet high in a lot of places out here. And they, they just worked at it day by day. We were paying them anywhere from 175 to $250 an acre. That's, that was because of the, it was a grant from the stimulus money. And they came in here. There's 139 acres in this stand. And we got it completely mulched. It was sometime during that winter. That following spring, just as a, to try, I went, we followed it in the spring. It was sometime in March or April before the green up was complete. We came in here and burned it. And then the following fall in September, the, that was part, this is part of the grant money too. We uh, put a herbicide treatment on it which was a uh, chopper and garlon as well. And uh, we had a skitter that came in here and it had a tank and it just sprayed out. And if you'll look out here, we, there's hardwoods out here and there's some that's alive and some that's dead. What happened was the, the chemicals that we put out really worked on the hardwoods and we had to leave spots to keep from, uh, so it wouldn't kill every hardwood. But that's why we don't have any of the uh, Yopon coming back to the degree that it would if we hadn't uh, sprayed it. Just coming in here and mulching it would not have done the job. It would have just sprouted back from the roots and it would have probably took it about a six months and it had been 15 feet tall again. But as far as, it, you know, and uh, I just want you to understand, I'm not saying that mulching and herbicides are, are going to replace prescribed fire. It's an alternative because, uh, you know, prescribed fire is a lot cheaper. You know, $175 to $250 for mulching, and then you got from $75 to $90 for the, the spray treatment. That can get expensive. You know, whereas you're, you're doing uh, prescribed fire for, say, $25 an acre. But uh, there's places that you can't prescribe burn, and there's going to be more and more of those places in the future a lot more of them. And I just wanted y'all to see kind of what we had done here. It causes smoke hazards. Smoke hazards, uh, you know, you just got the, they, they, with our organization, we call it the Wildland Urban Interface. There's more and more people and it's harder and harder to burn. When, whenever we come out and we burn an area, we have to develop a plan on it. And we have to uh, go through procedures as far as getting approval to uh, burn it. And then we have to get the right weather. And if we ain't got it, we can't burn it. And you know, people like Bobby, myself, Chris, Mike, we're, we're prescribed, we've got a license. And if something went haywire, it's our license that we're dealing with. So, you know, there's just time when you can't burn. And it, like right now, one of our problems is it's too dry to burn. Another problem we've got, we've got too much going on. We don't have the manpower. So it's just getting harder and harder to burn. What about, what about a landowner? And he's thinking about, well, you know, I need to clear my land because I, I want to do all this stuff. I'll just set a match to it. What, what, what do you do? 
Well, I wouldn't set a match. <laughs> I'm saying, what would the procedure be? I, I know people who have just done that. I, what I would do is, if I was thinking about burning, as I would in Geneva County, you'd contact Bobby Light at their office. And you can go online, and we've got, or the Forestry Commission's got a website, and there's all kinds of contact with them. First thing is, if you don't sell timber on a regular basis, the best thing you can do is hire or at least get some advice from a, a professional forester, a consultant forester, risk forester. Often, you know, with our job too, we'll have folks come by and say, yeah, somebody stopped by. You know, I had a couple of trees dying in my plantation and so-and-so stopped by and said, well, the bugs are just eating it up and you need to clear cut it. And we go out there and it's just a few black turpentine beetles in a tree and it may kill three or four, but you know, that's just part of nature. And they don't need to do that. So before you, you know, cut timber, you know, contact a professional forester. Not a logger, not a timber buyer, but a professional you know, forester. And you know, with us working with the state, we have no interest at all, you know, whether as far as financially, whether you sell your timber or not. We have an interest that you don't you know, get taken or you don't you know, do it wrong, but we don't have any financial interest in it, so you know, we can give you our unbiased opinion on what you need to do. But you know, we can't sell the timber for you. That's a consultant for your job. So first thing is you hire you know, uh, or contact the consultant for you. And uh, part of this too is with selling timber, you, know, you need to have a management plan. You, know, you need to have a plan there before, before you put the first chainsaw or the first feller buncher out there on the ground. You, you know, come up with a plan, you know, what you're wanting to do with that. Uh, and if you have that plan before you cut, that can affect the way that you go, you know, the way or when or, or, or what kind of timber set you may have. So, you know, have a plan, in, you know, whether it's preferably it should be written. And uh, if you do have a plan, you know, that's the best time to go back and, and review your plan and update your plan is right before you, you, know, you sell your timber. Make sure that, that plan is, is still a valid plan. And uh, with certain, certain programs like Treasure Forest, Tree Farm, uh, even Carbon Sequestration, you have to have a plan in order to be one of those, you know, in that program. And so, you know, Every time you go to sell timber, if you don't do it on a yearly basis or annual basis, at least when you look at selling timber, go back and review your plan and update. Once you have decided to sell, you know, don't just kind of throw it out there. You need to do some planning, some pre-planning on it. There again, like out here, you you want to know what's out there. Uh, you know, maybe part of that consult force your job. If you're going to do a lump sum sale. And he goes out. He does a cruise on it so that you know what you have out there. So whenever you put it up for bids, it, you know the bids coming in, you'll know you know, whether there's you should take those bids or, or no sell them. You know, it, you know, in timber prices that they fluctuate wildly. So you know, you need to know, you know what the timber prices are doing. But plan your harvest. You know, plan where you're going to put your, your loading decks. Uh, aesthetics is you know, one of the things that we you. Know, encourage folks to do with their forest. It's not just picking up the garbage or uh, planting a few showy trees, but planting where your logging deck's gonna go. You know, usually that's gonna be the, the ugliest part of the logging operation is where that deck is. So, you know, don't put it right there where you look at it every day when you, you leave your house. You know, put it somewhere, you know, it's still gotta be accessible to the road and uh, convenient, you know, for them to, to skid to, but you know, try to pick a place that's not visible to the public or that you see every day because it's going to take it it will heal over in a couple of years and, and you, a lot of times you can use that for uh, wildlife openings uh, so that you the next time you harvest you still have those you use those same areas but you know that's part of pre-planting uh, just like with BMPs you know, 
BMPs are very important best management practices. If you have a stream on your property, you know, those are mandatory BMPs there if you start crossing that stream. So you have to know, you know the BMPs and make sure that's uh, part of your pre plan. Uh, then, you know, with the person that, if you, either you're doing it or if you hire a consultant, decide how you want to sell that thing. You know, this was sold lump sum, which went out there, this was marked, and they marked the trees that was going to keep, everything else was to come out. And then they sent it out for bid, so uh, this was a lump sum bid. The other way you can do it is you negotiate, and it could be on, uh, you know, you, if it's, and normally negotiation is done where if you have a relationship with a, a dealer or a company, uh, you may negotiate a, a per ton price where whatever they cut to put on the truck and hauled out and you get paid you know, your part of it. Lump sum bid, you know, if they overpay then you may make more money, but if they underpay then you may not make as much. So you have to look at what your options are. And that's where that consultant forester can help you decide whether you want to do a lump sum or you want to do a per unit or negotiated uh, sale. And if you have a lot of poles in it, like this would have, sometimes you know, a negotiated sale may be better than a lump sum because the pole market is up and down too, but usually it holds its value more than, than logs do. So it may be that you, know, you can negotiate with that pole company uh, and get a better price. But um, when you do that, you know, kind of getting to selling actual prices, if you have a lot of poles and you're taking the poles out, and a lot of times uh, the log company, if they're not the same company, aren't, aren't going to pay you as much as they would if they're, you're not taking poles. Because on poles is where they normally, if they're selling or if they're cutting them in the saw in the lumber. They get their overrun on the poles because the poles are straight. They don't have as much defects, so they get. That's where they make you know, money as a logging company or a sawmill on buying those those poles, some type trees. Whereas the pole mill, you know, it, it's going to pay you uh, more per ton. Uh, that takes a better tree. So you got to. That's a trade-off you have to look at. That's why you have to know what's out there. And normally it's better to sell your poles even if you do get a lower price from your logs. If you have, that goes back to how much volume you have. If you just have a few loads, it may not be worth it. But if you have a hundred loads, it makes a big difference. Uh, then probably the biggest thing we get into when it's with uh, the legal part is a contract. Like I said, if, if you, if we, when we took a, a so-called timber theft case to a DA, the first thing he asked was there a contract. If there's no contract, he didn't even want to talk to us. So, you know, I bought timber for eight years after I got out of college and run a coal mill. And I bought timber and I probably out of a hundred or more timber deals, I have probably only two contracts we ever you know, actually signed. But you know, I, we had a family business, everybody knew us. And you know, it was a handshake type thing. That was, of course, 25, 30 years ago. So things have changed. But now, you know, we recommend that if, if you're going to sell, you have a contract. And in that contract is where you specify what's going to happen on your property. We get a lot of complaints that, well, you know, they just ruined my property. They just left stuff everywhere. You know, and they said they were going to do a good job. And we go out there. I look and say, well, where's the, where's the problem? You know, and the, the logging crew did a great job. They, they, they did what they were supposed to, but as you see, they left a lot of uh, debris out there, and, and that landowner thought that it was going to be a, like a park when they got through. You know, he just didn't have the understanding of what was going to be there. So, you know, a contract hopefully would you know, help. It may not help that situation. That's kind of an extreme situation, but in that contract, you spell out your BMP spell out what happens if they cut trees they're not supposed to. You spell out, you know, if they damage the road or if, if you need a, a, a stream crossing put in, you know, it can be part of the contract or actually it may even be on prospectus if you're going to lump sum it. You can put that in as part of your prospectus that, you know, along with this sale, you've got to put in a stream crossing that meets the uh, federal BMPs. And that, you know, of course, that means you're going to get less money for your timber, but they're, because they, they can't put in that crossing for 
three. You know, so it's gonna they're gonna back that out of your timber, but you know it's gonna be done properly. Instead of you I'm not saying you don't know what you're doing, but you know, I've, you know some landowners just think you can go out there and do certain things and you can't. So you know just the contract is, is really what makes it a, a truly a timber sale and then you have some legal recourse if something goes wrong. Um, and like I said, there's, I'm not going to go over everything in here because we wouldn't have the time. But uh, then once you have the contract done and then or in the timber sold, normally the contract track is going to be signed. If it's a lump sum, contract signed after the, you know, the bid opening is compelled. Uh, then you still want to monitor. You don't want to you know, just turn it over and say, okay, y'all go to it. You know, just like out here, Chris and Daryl there, when they were out here logging, they were out here every day. You know, and, and not getting on, on anybody, but just like me, if, if I know my daddy was gonna be there every day, we was out picking, you know, tomatoes for truck farming, I knew we were gonna make sure we picked them right and that we did what we were supposed to. If I knew he wasn't gonna be there, we might slack off a little bit. So, you know, it's human nature. So monitor that contract, I mean, the logging operation. Just cause you sold it. Uh, whether, like I said, it was lump sum or negotiated, you know, make sure they're not cutting trees that they weren't supposed to cut. Make sure, you know, if, if, if you're lump, if you sold it on a negotiated, then you need to make sure that they're merchandising it right, that they're not hauling poles to the sawmill. You know, if you sold it lump sum, then, you know, what they do with it, once they put it on the truck, they can take poles to the, the puck we jar because it's sold to them as long as, you know, they're just cutting what, was actually theirs to cut. So, you know, the different selling tech, uh, types really depend, you know, kind of, you have more involvement. So, if it's lump sum, you still need to be out here monitoring, making sure they're not cutting what they're not supposed to be and that they're maintaining the, the roads and that sort of thing. But if you do a negotiated sale, then it's really very important that you or your consultant forester or somebody is out here, you know, on the site, and it don't have to be sit, sitting there, you know, every time they're here, you know, just watching what they're doing. Just, you know, just come by, check on them once a day. It could be every two days. Uh, and then once they, you know, most loggers aren't going to resent the fact that you're out there. I've talked to a lot. I know when I was out, you know, logging, running a crew, I wanted the logger, I mean, the landowner to come out because I wanted feedback from him uh, or her make sure that what we were doing was what they wanted because I wanted to come back again six or eight years later and, and cut it again. You know, if it's a, you know, something like uh, uneven age management where you're, you're, you're cutting it you know, every six or seven, eight, ten years. Or so, uh, even if not that, the next sale they had, you want to come back. So most of the time if the logger is doing, or the timber buyer is doing what he's supposed to do, he's not, you know, going to mind out there checking on and uh, I'll, you know, ask, uh, he may even be looking for that feedback. But after you monitor the harvest, like I said, scale tickets, if, like, if you sell it on a negotiated where you're getting paid by the unit, whether it's you know, by the ton for poles or put wood or saw logs, chip and saw, canter wood, uh, chips, or just, there's a numerous different products, well you just, you know, you should be getting copies of the tickets every week of what's being sold. You know, the mill's gonna provide uh, that timber buyer with with the printout too. But you should have a copy of everything that he has as far as the the scale tickets of what was taken, you know, by what product and then uh, you just can kind of balance that out and that that's what you can use. If you had a cruise prior to the sale, you kinda get use that to gauge see if 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 it's close, and it's not going to be close.
problems with the ecosystem uh, light. We're trying to work with the landowner there. Typically the treatment to get rid of them is copper sulfate. And you try to put in a high enough concentration of copper sulfate to kill the, the snails, but, but not kill the fish. That's kind of a balance in that. Uh, we checked it again. This was last fall when we found it. And we helped get the pond treated. Uh, we went back and checked it last week and only found one live one, which is better, but it's still not good. We won't get rid of all of them because this creek, or this pond, drains into a, a little bit larger creek that's only about a, a four-mile course down to the Pea River. And we'd rather, we'd really, if they get out in the Pea River, they're kind of the cats out of the bag then. Um, but it's just, you know, it's just another example of an exotic that doesn't have to be introduced. I mean, you look at terrestrial, we got kudzu, we got fire ants, all that, the, the exotic species are real problems. And the main reason exotics are such a problem is because they don't have natural predators, you know, in the area they're introduced. Uh, these, I'm sure maybe raccoons might eat these. But more than likely, they're not going to be able to eat them enough to keep them from getting to be a problem and getting them widespread. Uh, these usually eat, like I said, aquatic vegetation, and that's something that, you know, if, if they really got to be a high population of them, they could have effects on, you know, waterfowl not having uh, food in the rivers and all that. So, so we really want to try to keep them out. And that's why we always encourage everybody not to dump you know, an aquarium or, or even a bait bucket or something like that, when they get through fishing, don't dump it back in the water. I know nobody wants to kill animals, but it's still better if you just get rid of the bait by, by pouring it out and not, because there's some species of fish called roach and rud that look a lot like little crappy minnows when they're small. And they have been introduced by people dumping bait buckets in place known exotics fish that we have in the state now y'all probably seen on some of the tv channels the uh the silver and the big head carp the asian carp uh, they're closely related to the grass carp or what they call white amore and right now it's still legal in alabama to use grass carp in your ponds and people use them a lot because they're a very effective weed control in a small body of water they've even used them for hydrilla control at Lake Eufaula, which is very uh, strong opinions on both sides of the Corps of Engineers doing that, but I won't, won't get into that right now. But the grass carp are very good at weed control because usually you stock them at a real young size, they'll be nine or ten inches long, like after they're about six months old. And you want to have them that big so that the bass in the pond won't eat them. But they're usually really good. If you put a high enough rate in to eat the weeds faster than the weeds are growing, they can keep weeds out of a pond for six, seven, eight years. But once they get real big, they're like most animals. Their feed efficiency gets to a point where they're just not eating a lot of weeds, and the weeds grow a lot faster than they're eating them, and they're not good for control past usually about seven years. Um, but that's something that, that we allow people to use in the state because typically with grass carp they have to have a long stretch of free flowing river before their eggs can be viable for hatching uh, and, and we really you know the Choctahatchee is the only free flowing river that, that doesn't have a dam on it all the way down to the dam or to the bay in, uh, at Destin there and so we really haven't seen any evidence of grass carp reproduction but still the potential's there and I've got a feeling with the way that people are really uh, pushing away from exotics and getting more toward natives, um, that probably it'll get where you can't get just regular grass carp put in your pond. They'll have to be triploid grass carp, which is mostly what all the private hatcheries are stocking now. Uh, triploid grass carp, their eggs have gone through a, a temperature change process to where even though they could, could hatch the eggs out and grow out the triploid grass carp, they're not able to reproduce. Uh, even if they had the perfect conditions, they, they're sterile, they can't reproduce. So even if they're in the pond and they get out after a flood or something, we're, we're trying them and usually what happens is you get a flood and they get out of the, the hatchery ponds and they get in the wild. We found them in the Alabama River and 
uh, even the Tennessee River some, but, but not very many. I don't think we have a problem with them like they do up north in the Ohio River where you see the, the films of where they're just jumping everywhere. Uh, another exotic that people raise, especially around here in Geneva County, are tilapia. And tilapia have been really um, pushed as a forward species for trying to grow out bigger bass. And, and it works to a point. If you've got a pond that's already crowded up with little small stunted bass and you put tilapia in there, usually all the tilapia reproduction will be eaten up by all those little bass and, and you won't get a lot of benefit from it. But if, if your bass population is low enough and you put the tilapia in, the thing about tilapia is when the water gets cool, usually in the 60s, they get real sluggish and slow. And the bigger bass can really feed on them and, and grow out on them. But then, on a typical winter, when the water temperatures get down in the 50s, they die out. And so that's why there's no state regulation against stocking tilapia in private ponds, because usually they're going to die out on a normal winter. Now, I know that this past winter, several ponds that I'm aware of, they didn't die out, and they're still in there, um, because it's just such a mild winter. But Typically, you know, we, we, the only wild population that I'm aware of, we had some in a, a little creek called Gin Creek in the Lake Eufaula. Uh, there was some tilapia bedding in there, but once we had a pretty cold winter, they were gone. We couldn't find them anymore. Uh, but that's, you know, that's some of the exotic species that I just wanted to recap a little bit. Yes, sir. Are tilapia the same as Nile perch? Yes, sir. Now perch is a, a variety of it. There's many different varieties of tilapia, blue tilapia and nilotica and all that. But yeah, the now perch is a common name for them. And a lot of people that are trying to raise some really big bass, you know, they, they're big into stocking them in the spring because they, they reproduce really, really heavy. Yeah. And then in the fall when that water gets cool, they'll get real sluggish and slow and the bass just eat them up. But, you know, they're... There again, it's one of those deals where if you've already got a bass crowded pond, you're just wasting your money because all those little bass are going to eat them up most of the time and not really grow out on them. But any questions about, you know, exotic species? And, yes, ma'am. How do you, I mean, do y'all come out and look at ponds? We have a pond and <coughs> we've lived there for about 12 years and I know the, the former owners put the, um, the, White amoras in there? Right. We've got them. Yeah, they grow out huge. They're giant. <laughs> I mean, what do you do with them? Well, they're not really hurting anything. Uh, a lot of people do not like white amoras because they feel like, you know, they're in the pond, they're digging up all my brim beds, they're causing a probably muddying up the pond. And, you know, they get a bad reputation from that because of common carp. Common carp are another exotic, actually, from Europe. You know, the old orange carp, like you see in the river. You never want to get those in your pond if you can help it. Because they do, they burrow in the mud, and they keep your pond muddy, and, and they do dig through the brim beds and all that. They're a real problem. The Asian, the uh, grass carp, or the white amore, they're not, they don't dig in the mud like that. They mainly eat vegetation. They will eat a little fish every once in a while because you'll even catch one on a lure every once in a while. Mm -hmm. But when they're big like that, they're not hurting a whole lot. They, the biggest pain that they can be is if you're trying to feed your fish, they love fish food like oh, candy. Yeah. And they'll just <laughs> knock the brim and the catfish out of the way and they're yeah. like a vacuum cleaner you eating. chum the water and the, the kids eat, love it. Right. Like a... And if you're not... <laughs>
B? Mm -hmm. Is that your husband? Yes. He's a yeah. handsome man. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, do you, you own land around here? In Coffee Springs. Coffee Springs? Mm -hmm. Okay, did you learn anything here today? That, oh, yeah. Plenty. Did you, have you ever been here before? Yes, we have been. Okay, have you ever come over here just to, for recreation? No, just to experience and to find out what this is all about. Oh, okay. You plan on coming back? Oh, we certainly will. We have a grandson coming in tomorrow and we uh, would like to bring him over here or them to hopefully s discover an alligator. Uh, well, um, I don't, okay. Well, I hope you enjoy your lunch and uh, we'll you. see you guys later. And thanks for talking to us. Thank, Thank you. you. What a great time here in the Geneva State Forest. And those guys, they knew what they were talking about, didn't they? And it was it was a great tour. Thanks a lot, guys. And uh, the lunch was fantastic. Well, we'll see you later here in the great outdoors. <laughs>